Paige, are you there? Here now, yep. Is, do you have the controls? I do. I'm not sure how the webinar started, but um, it did. Okay, can you hear me okay? I can. Great. Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to today's RIT syndrome.org RIT Ed webcast. Today we're going to be talking about RIT syndrome research outlook 2019 and beyond with RIT syndrome's chief science officer, Steve Kaminsky. This is Paige Nuez, Director of Family Empowerment at RIT syndrome.org, and I will be your moderator today. Our board of directors and all of us at RITSyndrome.org want to personally thank you for your support and engagement in improving the quality of life for all of our children and families. Rit syndrome is a rare disorder and as such, continuous awareness, empowerment, and research is everything to us. I say that as both a parent to a beautiful 16-year-old teenager with Rit syndrome and as a representative of RITSyndrome.org. It's the necessity and the tie that binds us together into our very rare but mighty REC community. As I said, we're so pleased to bring you today's presentation. With Rett syndrome being a childhood onset disorder with a prognosis of living well into adulthood, all of us have a very deep and long relationship to our loved ones with Rett syndrome and want nothing more than to achieve better treatments and the ultimate gift, a cure for Rett syndrome for our own child and for all diagnosed with Rett syndrome. Today, we're going to address the plan to make this dream a reality and the steps being taken to achieve this. Before we begin, I'd like to share some brief tech points on how GoToWebinar operates if this is your first time joining us. The, auto, the audio feed is open to our presenters only, so you don't have to worry about your background noise interfering with the presentation. If you look to the upper right corner of your screen, you'll see a control panel window. We invite you to type your questions or comments in the question field throughout the presentation, and we will answer these at the end, as well as any questions that were pre-submitted at the time of registration. If we don't get to your question today, I'll work with Steve to get all writing questions answered, and we'll post a QA document to the RET Ed webpage once we get that completed. If the control panel window is distracting to you, you can minimize or move the window, then you can expand it at any time if you wish to submit a question. Next point, this is very important, the, ses the session is being recorded today, and we'll post a link of the recording along with a QA document if necessary to the RET Ed webpage so you can listen again or share this broadcast with others. If you're having trouble hearing, please check and turn up the volume on your phone or device or let me know via the question box if you're having some technical issues and I'll try to work with you. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce today's speaker and fantastic presenter, our very own RITSyndrome.org Chief Science Officer, Steve Kaminsky. I'd like to go ahead and turn the slide, here we go, turn the slides over to Dr. Kaminsky and let you go ahead and begin with your presentation. I know we have a lot of material to cover today. Thank you, Paige. Let's see if I can get this to, there we go. Um, well, first I'd like to say thanks to everyone for taking time to essentially uh, participate in the webinar uh, in the middle of the day here on the East Coast and in your morning on the West Coast. Um, so I'm gonna actually take us through essentially some of, of what we're doing at RETSyndrome.org. Um, one of the things I'm going to be doing is actually doing a very short, brief status update of the current and future tr clinical trials that are being planned. I'm gonna talk to you about the funding recommendations I took to the board in December and what we've actually done with those. And then finally, um, in the last couple of slides, sort of our view of this year, 2019 and beyond, the next uh, you know, three to five to 10 years. So strategies uh, in regard to research at RETSyndrome.org um, are actually very deep and wide, and they have been around for some time. Um, if you think about Rett syndrome and you think about all the discoveries, it's still uh, only first described 52 years ago by Andreas Rett, 
But um, about 20 years ago, Dr. Huda Zogby and her team actually recognized what gene was associated with Rett syndrome. And of course, that's MECP2. And over the last 25 years, a tremendous amount of research has taken place to really learn a, a lot about the basic science of, of Rett syndrome. And at rettsyndrome.org, one of the things we sort of pride ourselves on and one of the things we try to do is how can we take those basic science lessons and essentially try to translate those lessons into essentially ways to actually do clinical research and to change the quality of life of uh, both boys and girls and women with Rett syndrome. So this basic science research has really led us to, to, to two fundamental ideas. And one is in order to really uh, get at Rett syndrome, one of the things we have to try to do is to fix MECP2 uh, at the fundamental level. If we can fix the DNA, we may be able to fix the syndrome. If we can't fix the DNA, we know that MECP2 actually has a lot of downstream effects on other molecular targets, uh, whether they be growth pathways, whether they be signaling pathways within neurons. Um, uh, so the another idea is that, well, if we at attack the downstream pathways, maybe we can correct the biology that's associated with, uh, that's gone wrong in Rett syndrome. So we have actually looked very hard at how do you fix MECP2, or if you can't fix MECP2, what can you do downstream? Now, if you're attempting to fix MECP2, there's been essentially really three different approaches to try to fix the gene itself. One is essentially through gene therapy, just bring in a new gene and have the new gene essentially express MECP2. This does create some challenge in that we know that if you actually express too much MECP2, there's another syndrome called MECP2 duplication. So this is a very, this is very fine tuning you have to do in order to get gene therapy to work the way we hope it would work. Another avenue is that in the case of girls, they have two X chromosomes. They have one X chromosome that has a normal MECP2, and they have another X chromosome that has a mutant MECP2. Well, it would, wouldn't it be nice if you could activate in, a, in the mutant cell the silent X to express the normal MECP2? So that's another avenue of research that people are undertaking. And finally, there's essentially a, a, a group of mutations called nonsense mutations. These are mutations that put a stop codon, and a stop codon is essentially a, 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 a signal that tells RNA polymerase to fall off the DNA molecule. The idea is that if you can essentially get a compound that doesn't recognize the stop codon in these nonsense mutations, you could get a full-length MECP2 made uh, in all of the uh, individuals with a nonsense mutation. And, and, and by the way, there's about 35% of, of girls with, with Rett syndrome have a nonsense mutation. So this is not trivial from the standpoint of the numbers of people that could actually help. So all of this is to try to correct and get normal MECP2 protein in the cell. Now, we've been working hard um, the NIH, us, and other foundations have been working hard to essentially approach this. But at the same time, if, if we can't do this, we can actually go after downstream targets. And the downstream targets are things like growth factors, um, uh, and, and again, uh, insulin-like growth factor, brain-derived neurotropic factor, uh, NMDA pathways and GABA pathways are essentially just uh, essentially channels that help uh, cells communicate, and we know that they're not quite normal or don't work quite right in Rett syndrome. So if we can attack those pathways, we can maybe set up better communications in Rett syndrome. And finally, the mitochondria also seem to be affected in Rett, in Rett syndrome. So if we could uh, attack sort of oxidative stress pathways, we may be able to essentially make this cell a more stable cell and therefore help uh, normalize the, the, uh, the CNS environment for, for girls and boys. So 
Could any of these lead to a cure? And this is a very important question. And the answer is yes, it, these could. Might it be one that leads to a cure? We don't know. Might it be a combination of these that could lead to a cure? We don't know. The, the, the thing that we, we do know is that we have to try all of it, whether it's fixing the gene or downstream or going after downstream targets. It may be a combination of everything in this area that actually leads us to a cure down the road. So we can't leave any stone unturned. We have to approach it all. And so research is st still going on over here and research is still going on over here. Hopefully at somewhere down the road, we will actually be able to say the combination of this plus this or this alone or this alone could lead to a cure. But we won't know that until we actually do the clinical trials that show that. And um, another important question is how important is timing? Well, remember this is a developmental disorder. The earlier you can make the diagnosis, the earlier you can start treating, the, the better your outcomes will probably be. So timing is everything. And again, in this regard, one of the futures that we have to continue to think about is how do we make these diagnoses earlier? Because the earlier we can make them, the earlier we can start treating, and hopefully that will keep the normal development along its normal path, and it won't be skewed down a, 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 a ret developmental pathway. And finally, how important is physical therapy and occupational therapy or cognitive therapy, speech therapy? These are incredibly important. We have, we have seen in mouse models, and we've now, with uh, work that we've done with Jenny Downs in Australia, an enriched environment is absolutely necessary to try to keep functions that girls have attained. And if you are disciplined and consistent in these physical therapies or occupational therapies, cognitive therapies, speech therapies, you are more likely to actually also have gain of function. So all of this is important. Remember, the research that we're talking about from basic science and trying to get therapies is essentially research that is trying to correct what's happening in a normal neuron. And if we can correct what's happening in the neuron, those neurons will form more connections to other neurons, more synapses. And the more synapses we have, the greater the number of neural networks we can have. And all of you know how challenging it is to learn something new. You, you don't walk up to the piano and, pay, and play Beethoven's uh, uh, Emperor Concerto without ever practicing, learning, and actually doing it over and over and over again. And so this physical therapy and occupational therapy, cognitive therapy and speech therapy are all very important components. And so all of this down here is important from the standpoint of what is a cure? How do we actually move forward if we can correct biology? And how do we actually fire and wire the new networks that we're able to make? Now I'm going to make a, take a quick review of clinical trials because there were some questions about that before the webinar. So I'm gonna talk about some active trials and, and some upcoming trials, but I'm gonna do this very quickly because you can actually go and look at this at clinicaltrials.gov, but for the sake of just uh, answering some questions that came up prior to the webinar, I, I will uh, make a quick run of these. So active trials. Uh, Serazotan, which is, uh, which is a drug that is the intellectual property, is held by Neuron Pharmaceuticals. Um, it has just concluded the enrollment in its phase two, phase three trial. This is the first multi-country trial that's ever been attempted in Rett syndrome. This particular drug is essentially going after a receptor. That receptor is the 5-HT1A agonist. It, and, and what they're hoping to do is essentially Preclinical data showed that serazotan could improve breathing. That trial was with girls uh, who were six years and older, and they were actually uh, monitoring the girls uh, with uh, wearable devices. So it was a very objective measure of what was going on with breathing. It wasn't parents essentially reporting. It was essentially a wearable device that was, was, was actually monitoring the breathing. 
So the important point is that the enrollment has concluded and they're collecting data on the last girls who have been enrolled in that protocol. And once they finish their timeline on the protocol, the analysis of that data will actually start, will begin and then they will report out to us. So this one is closed. It's still active because it's ongoing and hopefully in a short period of time, we'll actually know the results of that. The important piece of that is this was a phase two, phase three trial. And if in fact it looks very positive and, and the FDA uh, uh, likes what they see, this actually could end up being, um, because it's a phase two slash phase three, it could be written for, uh, Ser Serizotan could be written up for a new designation and that is to treat the breathing challenges associated with Rett syndrome. The next one is triheptanoin. Um, this is a small trial that's being done down in, uh, down in uh, Atlanta with uh, Daniel Tarquinio. It's a preclinical treatment of uh, what this particular drug does. Is, is It's essentially a fatty acid that actually provides um, a, alternative energy source for the brain. And in preclinical trials with RET models, it showed that there was a, a, an, an improvement in motor performance. This is, a, as I said, a small trial, only 10 subjects. I don't know much, it's ongoing, and I'm sure that when it's done, Daniel will put, that, put that, uh, the results up on uh, the uh, uh, clinicaltrials.gov for all of us to essentially know and hear how, how this, the, uh, uh, whether or not this is gonna move forward into further clinical trials. Ketamine um, has been around a long time. It's, uh, it's a drug that's essentially an, an, um, works on an NMDA receptor. Uh, it's, it is a, an approved drug that's used in battlefield situations. It's used uh, in dentistry. Um, it's used in veterinarian medicine all the time. And uh, about, about uh, six years ago, it was shown that very low doses in Rett syndrome could actually delay the breathing challenges um, um, and improve some of the motor sensory uh, uh, skills in, in, in the RET model. Well, just recently, a phase two trial has opened up. Uh, it's it's, it's um, probably gonna be at seven sites, but it's, at, uh, the, it's actively um, uh, recruiting at both the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the Boston Children's Hospital. And they're hoping to see 48 girls, um, uh, six years of age to 12, uh, to see if in fact the doses that they're using do in, do in fact Im improve both the breathing and some motor sensory skills in, in Rett syndrome. Uh, Anavex 273 um, has actually, uh, it, has actually been approved by the FDA for a phase two safety trial. Sites are, sites are being selected as we speak and they should probably begin their trial this quarter or early into the second quarter of 19. So upcoming trials, uh, there was a couple of questions prior uh, to the, this, this webinar about trofinitide. Trofinitide is uh, entering the uh, phase three FS efficacy trial. This will be the largest of its type ever attempted. Um, right now, the, the, the companies Neuron and Acadia are looking at 12 to 15 sites. They will recruit upward of 180 patients. The trial will last for one year. Um, many of you have asked, um, why is it taking so long? And the answer to that question is really quite simple. It's manufacturing. In order to do this many subjects across that length of time, they literally, literally have to make over a ton of this compound um, for the clinical trial. And they actually do a lot of quality control. They make sure it's all the same. So they're in the manufacturing phase as we, uh, even as we speak. Uh, the inclusion and exclusion criteria still are being developed. They haven't been published yet. And this trial is due to start uh, in the second half of, of 2019. Another trial that many people are excited about is one by GW Pharmaceuticals. They're the company that actually had um, their uh, cannabinoid um, epidiolex uh, uh, actually approved by the FDA for other indications. And they uh, plan on starting their trial sometime in the first half of this year. 
um, which is exciting for for all of those uh, children um, who've uh, actually been taking uh, medical marijuana or CBD um, um, that can bought, be bought through uh, pharmacies. So this is actually a, a very important trial in that it's a purified form and the dose is known. There's no, um, you know, dosing difference from one place to another place. It's all very controlled. And as soon as the inclusion and exclusion criteria are disclosed, we will be putting those out for people to, to see. Um, and lastly, an upcoming trial is a very exciting trial by Avexis. This is the gene therapy trial <clears throat> that many of you have heard about. The, this comes from work from five papers published since 2013, mostly with male mice, but one of the papers did look at female mice. Right now, Avexis is currently working uh, to establish the up upcoming clinical trial and uh, we'll, we'll be working with the FDA uh, for an IND uh, um, as we speak. Um, more on the timing, inclusion, and exclusion criteria as it uh, comes, becomes available. I have been in discussion with them. Um, they're very, very uh, excited about this. So this is, this is a, a great opportunity for the community and we look forward to it. Now, um, I've put this slide in just so families can understand their federal government. And many of your, your eyes are rolling back in your head at this point and say, no one ever understands the federal government. But this is the way the federal government views essentially technical readiness and how long it takes to take a concept, the proof of a concept all the way through to essentially a drug deliverable um, as, a pharma as, as, as a prescription drug out the other end. So shortly, you know, uh, as I said, you know, Huda made an a, a, a observation 20 years ago that MECP2 was essentially the gene responsible for Rett syndrome. And right then and there, lots of research on MECP2 in regard to Rett syndrome started. And um, in this time frame, a lot of, of basic science and the best of that basic, basic science actually got moved into something called translational research. And this is when there's a lot of preclinical testing to see if in fact, <clears throat> what the basic scientists observed would actually be proof, would prove positive to move into the clinic. So if we think back to the, one of the very first slides I talked about, reactivating the silent X, <clears throat> read-through compounds, gene therapy, the Anavex clinical trial, the Serozotan clin clinical trial, or the Trophinotide clinical trial, I've tried to put them where they actually um, sort of fit on the federal re technical readiness level. And so you can see that <clears throat> reactivating the silent X is still really down here in the basic research proof of concept. Whereas a read-through compounds sit up here in translational, <clears throat> gene therapy is just about ready to make the, tra the transition from the preclinical translational into the clinical research. And so you can see, oh, this is exciting. This is about to enter a, the first phase uh, trial. We don't know if it will be a phase one safety trial or a phase two safety efficacy trial for the gene therapy. And the Anavex is approved and they are working in a, in a phase two. And serozotan and, and trophinotide sit up here in the phase two, phase three bracket. If these are successful, they could get um, uh, approved and then they would go into phase four, which is essentially just a monitoring, the federal government monitoring the results of, of of, their, of the decision of the FDA to make it a prescribable drug. So it's important for families to know that we're sitting out way out here and we've got a, a, a number of compounds that are coming forward. Now, the important thing for everyone to realize is that if none of these are successful, what we have to do is keep on pushing things out of this basic science into translational research into clinical research and we want to keep the pipeline going because we don't know what the outcome of these will be um, because they're still clinical trials and they can be they could work or they might not work so uh, now i'm going to get into our 2018 call for proposals letters of intent 
from around the world were received the summer of 2018. Uh, applications of those letters that we deemed um, good and appropriate um, were due the end of the, uh, end of the summer. We did a peer review of all of those proposals in October and November, and I made funding recommendations to our board in December. Now, so many of you would, would might ask, well, how can you actually look at all this research and try to figure out what should be emphasized, what shouldn't be emphasized? And that's a great question. And one of the things I wanna walk you through very, very quickly is how I think about Rett syndrome all the way from MECP2 to how Rett syndrome affects the community. So we know that MECP2 is the gene that's responsible for uh, the, the deficit that we actually see and we call Rett syndrome. And there's been a lot of studies about MECP2 and its DNA and what it does, how it actually is translated or not translated into RNA and how you might do research to try to make that happen. Um, I talked about one um, in regard to nonsense mutations with read-through compounds, how that essentially RNA is made into a protein and are, and are there ways to actually just move this protein into cells? How does that protein interact at a molecular level with other proteins? And that's really thinking about that whole idea of working on downstream targets that we talked about. So if we can't correct this, can we look at downstream targets and correct that? And how do those downstream targets, how do those molecular um, interactions actually affect cellular interactions? And this becomes really important because remember, the central nervous system is made up of many different cell types and those cells talk to one another. How do these molecular interactions affect those actual cellular interactions? One cell talking to another cell, one cell influencing another cell, one cell inhibiting another cell. So this becomes an important research component in Rett syndrome as well. And how do these cellular interactions affect the organization of the tissue itself? Uh, from the standpoint, remember, the central nervous system is predominantly a network. It's a, it's a network of cells, and those networks are in exceedingly important in how we do everything that we do, whether it's talking, whether it's moving, whether it's essentially your autonomic nervous system, taking care of seizures, taking care of breathing, taking care of your GI tract. Uh, and so all of this organization becomes important in actually attaining and acquiring new skills and helps with how the brain actually develops. And as that brain develops, it actually influences the actual individual. And that individual has an effect on the family and the community. So you can see that when we're essentially looking at research, we see that research from the very basic molecular aspects of Rett syndrome is absolutely necessary on this left side, but also the tissue interactions and tissue organization is equally important. And then how it affects the individual, the family and the community is also important. So we actually fund research along this spectrum because to leave any aspect of this out would essentially put a stop or a dam to really understanding how to best help an individual, how that individual actually interfaces and makes the quality of life of the family better and therefore also the community. So let's start out with the, the, the research. We received a, uh, around uh, 80 proposals. And out of those 80 proposals, the ones I'm gonna present to you are the highlights that we're, we've decided to go forward and fund. The first one I'm gonna talk about is Zhou Zhao out of the University of Pennsylvania, who's a very, very good mouse biologist, basic science researcher. And the thing that Joe is very interested in is despite all of our advances in studying the genetics of Rett syndrome, the exact mechanism of how MECP2 actually influences the neuro neurology of Rett syndrome is really poorly understood. And this is basically because the girls with Rett syndrome, 
not the boys, the boys only have one X chromosome, so all of their cells are affected. But in the girls, there's a essentially a mosaicism. They have some normal cells and they have some mutant cells. And how do these normal cells and mutant cells interact in order to give rise to Rett syndrome? So this mosaicism, this mixture of cells is very random in Rett syndrome. And what we're trying to do is understand, and what Joe's trying to do is to understand why two individuals with the same mutation could have very, very different symptoms. Very, they could be affected. One could be at one level of severity, another at another level of severity on the scale of, of severity in Rett syndrome. So what Joe is hoping to do is to be able to essentially address the role of the mosaicism and obtain a better understanding how the mutant cell and the normal cell interact or how mutant cells and mutant cells interact in order to essentially get a better understanding of how the developmental process in Rett syndrome moves forward. The second is a very interesting proposal that came out of Italy from uh, Antonio um, Cat uh, Cat uh, Catanio. And um, he is looking at nerve growth factor. Um, it's been, no, it's been uh, documented that nerve growth factor uh, is, is below normal in Rett syndrome. And many of the research believe, researchers believe that if you could increase nerve growth factor, you could potentially use it to treat Rett syndrome. The challenge is um, when you give uh, 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 nerve growth factor, one, it's a painful injection. And so that's very uh, uh, disturbing, but they've developed a recombinant nerve growth factor that's 10 times more powerful uh, and it has far less pain associated with it and it doesn't have to be injected. It can actually be given through an internasal delivery. So it's like uh, it, you breathe it in um, like you would uh, a nasal spray. And their hope um, is that the, the data that they've seen in Alzheimer's is very good and they've shown that it affects microglia and their hope is that the same kind of, of therapy um, will in Rett syndrome will affect the microglia and we know the microglia is, are, are abnormal in, in Rett syndrome and if this is uh, effective it could be a new way to approach the, essentially the, the, the nervous system in regard to Rett syndrome. Um, the next uh, uh, application that we've chose to fund is actually a, a mentored fellow. Um, so I, let me take a second to tell you what these are. These are younger scientists um, who are trying to make a career. Uh, and this individual, uh, uh, Saeed uh, Hannon, has chosen to try to make a career in Rett syndrome. And we at RettSyndrome.org feel it's incredibly important to be funding young fellows, uh, whether they're clinical fellows or research fellows, because we're going to need to continue to build the bench of the next generation of, of clinical researchers and uh, basic science researchers as we continue to solve the problems of Rett syndrome. So in the case of um, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Hannon, he is actually going to be looking at a particular set of receptors, the GABA-B receptor. And again, it's been shown that there are changes in the GABA-B in Rett syndrome. And what he is going to be doing is essentially looking at the role of the GABA-B uh, at the synapse. And again, remember, the synapse is everything in making neural networks. And his colleagues and he will be uh, looking at a wide range of techniques to identify how the receptors are affected uh, in Rett syndrome. Uh, and they're going to be developing a new Rett syndrome mouse with essentially a mutated GABA-B so that they can study the brain activity of these mice in regard to Rett syndrome and see if they can correct any of the behavioral changes through modulating the GABA-B receptor. Um, the, the next is uh, uh, er Erica Levitt of the University of Florida, a very interesting study. Um, and it can, and um, we've talked about serozotan and what serozotan is trying to do with breathing. This is essentially a study that's going after pretty much the same pathway, but with a more powerful compound. And so 
if serozotan proves to be effective in the in the clinical trial it's doing this is the next this might be the next compound in line to try to actually improve upon what what serozotan's doing so it's working at uh, on the d2 receptors and um, and again it's trying to increase connectivity between neurons themselves um, they're going to st study the effectiveness of, a, of this compound. Um, and again, they'll be comparing it against the best in class in this case. And in, in this case, it's the serozotan molecule. Uh, Allison Modry, who uh, we've, we have funded, this is a great story. I talked about mentored fellows a little while ago. Allison Modry was one of our, our mentored fellows um, well over a decade ago. He is now a full professor uh, at the University of California, San Diego, and is doing leading science uh, on Rett syndrome. And so this shows the power of that mentored science program and what it does for future, uh, for the future. And now we have Allison as a full professor, and he's going to be studying um, essentially the whole host of, of cells within the central nervous system in actually the the petri dish in something called uh, mini brain models uh, so he actually makes these mini brains if, in, in the petri dish so that he can actually study the interactions between the neurons the astrocytes and, and microglia cell and watch what happens when he actually manipulates the environment that they're in and one of the things that we know is that the astrocytes when they are not functioning properly they can become toxic and they can release something, a cytokine called IL-6, interleukin-6. And the interleukin-6 can damage the surrounding tissue. Now, what um, Allison will be doing is essentially with his mini brain model, he is going to be looking at IL-6 and seeing if in fact he can turn it down and turn it off um, um, with a particular drug called Actimer. Um, and if Actimer actually does this in the mini brain model, he'll be able to then essentially apply those results to actually take this as a drug for possible clinical use in Rett syndrome. Um, Sar Peters, um, who's at Vanderbilt, is doing a very interesting study on wearable devices. One of the challenges that all of us in the community face is what are the best outcome measures when we're doing a clinical trial? Today, we have uh, a outcome measures that are really more observational. They're behavioral questionnaires, they're clin clinician questionnaires, parent reporting questionnaires. And one of the things we'd like to do is actually have a more objective measure of whether someone is improving or not improving. And so what SAR is doing is essentially going to use wearable devices. And many of you have a wearable, wearable device on your wrist right now. You might have an Apple Watch, a Fitbit, a Garmin, all of those wearable devices monitor your activity. And so what SAR is doing is trying to develop a set of wearables that could be actually used when we're actually studying clinical severity in Rett syndrome. So she and her colleagues are going to be using a non-invasive wearable, and what they're hoping to do is study skin conductance, heart rate variability, and frequency of repetitive hand movements using those wearables. And they'll use smartphone technology to report and actually coordinate with parents. So the whole idea here, and this is very forward-looking, is how can we do better research in clinical trials if in fact we bring into those clinical trials devices that allow more objective observations to be made and we can take some subjectivity out of those observations so this is exciting from the standpoint that this could help with future clinical trials now the next two are really continuation grants uh, carrie fu at vanderbilt working with jeff newell who's studying a set, uh, we funded carrie uh, this is a clinical training fellow. So this is an MD who's learning how to do clinical research, doing their clinical traineeship. And our hope in funding clinical fellows is that they will become the next generations of clinicians 
that actually operate within our natural history study and at the clinics um, that are out there doing clinical trials. So this is building the next generation of clinical researchers to help all of, all of the children and adults with Rett syndrome. So Carrie is working with Jeff studying seizures. Carrie Buchanan's working out of the Greenwood Genetics Center, working with Steve uh, Skinner and Alan Percy. And they're really studying behavior and anxiety uh, biomarkers uh, for Rett syndrome. We funded both Carrie and Carrie last year, and we continue to fund them this year. <clears throat> Lastly, uh, two more. Jenny Downs out of Australia. Jenny has actually, uh, we've been funding Jenny for about a decade, and, and her research is really, um, it's, it's game changing from the standpoint that it has shown that enriched environments actually without any therapeutics, bi uh, biologic therapeutics, can actually change the course of Rett syndrome from the standpoint of um, this, the uh, keeping function or gaining function. And so this research um, is essentially a continuation of what <clears throat> we funded in the past, but what Jenny is going to be doing is actually developing a set of protocols that actually can be administered through telemedicine. Australia is a big co country, uh, like the United States, there are many people who can't get to clinics. So they're developing <clears throat> a set of exercises that can be, de can be executed with a parent, with a doc, uh, on a computer, and can actually help enrich their environment um, in this rural setting to essentially help them from the standpoint of developing new skill sets. Um, and Jenny's work has been game-changing in that it is now being incorporated by some of the forward-looking clinical trials as outcome measures for those clinical trials. So my, I, I, I think at RettSyndrome.org, we're very proud of the fact that we, we had an uh, insight <coughs> <clears throat> a while ago to fund this kind of research, and now it's paying off and it's being incorporated into clinical trials in the, in the form of outcome measures. And um, if this is successful, uh, what uh, Jenny will be doing is developing online resource, resources for parents in regard uh, to how they can interface with clinicians to increase the physical activity of any of the patients with Rett syndrome. Um, the last one I will talk about is Mir Lotan out of Israel. It's very similar to Jenny's, just a little bit different from the standpoint of what he's going to be going after. Again, um, home effectiveness um, with uh, children with chronic disabilities. He's done a pilot study in uh, Ireland, which was quite successful. Now he's moving this program uh, essentially to try to... Uh, uh, to, to prove that in fact we could do this across uh, across essentially uh, tele networks, um, this is all very exciting. The fact that if this is successful, we can essentially start to deliver some of these kind of physical therapy, occupational therapies um, via tele uh, telemedicine, where so people don't have to make the long treks into the medical centers to actually uh, um, benefit from those medical centers' uh, uh, expertise. So coming back to this spectrum of research, those people that I've just presented to you, you see where they are in this spectrum of research. Dr. Zhao looking at mosaicism, um, uh, Kat, uh, Katanino, uh, Levitt, and Hannan looking at essentially receptors, Ma uh, macromolecular interactions, uh, Allison Modry trying to understand how cellular interactions lead to tissue organization, and all the rest working from organ development up to the individual, and not only affecting the individual, but the family and the community as well. This is incredibly important because it, if we only work one side of this equation, the rest of the equation will have a stumbling block. We won't know how to actually help the individual. We won't know how to essentially help the family and how that inter interacts with IEPs that all of you are developing for your community. So we 
at rettsyndrome.org like to look at this whole spectrum and make sure we're trying to do research that spreads across the spectrum because this, in fact, will change the quality of life of the individual, the family, the community. And through correcting the biology that's on this end, we'll be able to help the individual at this end. So um, I'm coming to a close. So 2019 and beyond. I think it's really important for us to think about sort of near-term goals, long-term goals. You know, um, all of those clinical trials I talked about, um, if they're successful, we will celebrate and we'll celebrate hard and long. But if they're not successful, we have to have other things in the pipeline to try yet again. And so we continue to fund our SCOUT program, which is essentially a preclinical pipeline of molecules that we might take into the clinic in the near future. And hopefully, if we do get successful molecules in those, we can take them into clinical trials to change Rett syndrome. We continue to push, as you've heard me say over and over again, the occupational, the physical communication, cognitive therapies. And the reason for that is that if these therapies are directed at changing and correcting biology at the cellular level. The cellular level is essentially going to make a more stable neuron. A more stable neuron will make more synapses. With more synapses, we'll have more networks. And with networks comes the opportunity to gain function because everything we as humans do are derived from those networks, whether it's speaking, whether it's motor sensory skill sets like walking, throwing a ball, writing on a piece of paper, playing a piano, playing a violin. All of those things are essentially network actions. And by correcting the biology at this point in time, we then have to essentially try to correct the neurology, the essentially the neural networks using these kind of, 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 of tools and today, these tools have not been specific for Rett syndrome. There, may be some, they, there might be tools out there for people who have had stroke, people who have had traffic accidents, traumatic brain injury. And what we don't know is, are those tools the same tools that will work in a developmental disability like Rett syndrome? So we, we, we need to actually test that and actually test to make sure that that is essentially the truth, or is there a better way to do physical therapy or occupational therapy with a child with a developmental disability versus a child who's had a skateboard accident or who's been in an automobile accident? So turning to long range goals, again, um, even if gene therapy or RNA editing or activating the silent X or read through compounds become a reality, there will be a constant evolution. What's the next vector? What's the better way to essentially deliver those therapies? So we keep that as a long-term goal to keep on define, redefining and refining our techniques to essentially change the, the, the gene at the genetic level. And the idea of testing devices that could help with the neurologic development in physical therapy or occupational therapy and, and very importantly, and not talked about very often, is earlier diagnosis and earlier intervention. So the earlier we can make a diagnosis, the earlier we can intervene, and hopefully push development, developmental biology down its normal course. So in closing, the idea is to take the basic research ideas that are coming out of the a, a plethora of places, NIH funding, private foundation funding, see if any of those proof of concepts can be moved into translational medicine where there is essentially intellectual property that can be picked up by pharmaceutical companies, by companies that are developing devices that actually can help us move those to the bedside over to clinical research. And at the same time, be looking at innovative ways to do neurohabilitation. These are the physical therapies, the occupational therapies, cognitive therapies, speech therapy, all of the things that we're going to need to have in hand once we've corrected the biology that this group of scientists 
say it can, it can be corrected. Once we correct the biology, we now have to rewire the neurology. So um, with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And I want to do one last thing. Um, all of the families might not know the hard work of a single individual at RettSyndrome.org over the past uh, seven years. And this is Dr. Janice es Escano. Janice has been the manager of, of grants and research um, since I came to RettSyndrome.org. She is by far one of the best scientists I've ever worked with, um, bar none. I've worked with uh, at, at the NIH, I've worked at Baylor College of Medicine, at the DOD's medical school. No one is as good as Janice. And Janice has a career opportunity that she has seized upon. She will be leaving RettSyndrome.org. And I can tell you it is a sad day in my heart that Janice is leaving, but at the same time, I celebrate her success in, in essentially advancing her career. She will be sorely missed. There is no one that I know of that's more compassionate and more excited about the progress that's happened in Rett syndrome. So I wish Janice um, fair sailing and a great career. She has a great career ahead of her. And I will sorely miss her, as will all the families uh, who've come to know her, as well as all the scientists. With that, I'll stop, Paige, and we can do questions if you want to. Thank you, Steve. That was uh, an incredible presentation. And um, to your last comment, Janice, we truly do wish you well. And we thank you for everything that you have done to get us where we are today in the field of research for Rett syndrome. Um, and you know that you are always part of our Rett syndrome family. And I know that you'll stay watching and seeing how uh, the field continues to progress. But thanks for the groundwork you've laid. And uh, Steve, thank you for an incredible presentation talking about how wide and how deep the field of research is. And for helping us understand that there is a plan and giving us an update of where we are as a foundation and what we're funding, but also the macro level of what's happening in the US and around the world for research. It's, as a parent, I know it's incredibly difficult for me to wrap my head around the details, but it really uh, gives me such great hope that progress is on the horizon and um, not just on the horizon, but it's in the here and now. So what I would like to do is take some time to go through the questions that have been submitted in the queue and uh, leave your slides up so that you can reference back um, if a visual will help answer them. And uh, to everyone in our audience, we're going to stay on the phone um, for about 20, 30 more minutes and go through your questions. So please feel free to submit them. We'll go ahead and take them in order of submission. Okay. So. Um, Steve, the first one in the queue goes back to the trifinitide trial. And we have um, the same question from two incredible parents that participated, two different families that participated in the very first um, trial. And they are true trailblazers, and we have them to thank. They both have questions, though, about some of the recent announcements that have come from Acadia and Nurin about phase three participation and eligibility. And, um, they are wondering if you know if the families from 2013 will be eligible to participate in this um, next phase. Um, I wish I did. Um, I'm, I've gone back to that slide and what I, this bullet, inclusion and exclusion criteria are still being developed. Um, since the, they are manufacturing a lot of compound right now, they're still working with the clinicians and their science advisory group on what is the best age bracket to essentially work um, with this trial. So I don't know that as of yet, but I think it, um, probably as they get closer to the trial, that will all be published. So at this point in time, I do not know the answer to that question, Paige. OK, thank you. And uh, we will continue to communicate as soon as we have information from the study sponsors, Acadia and Nurin. Um, they are making public press releases um, as updates are available, and we will continue to pass them on through our communication channels. But I do want to thank every family that participated um, to get us here. This is a very exciting time. 
I mean, I'm going to move to the next question in the queue. Um, a parent is asking uh, in the neurohabilitation um, arena that you discussed, you talked about something called cognitive therapy, and that's not currently a therapy that I think a lot of families are familiar with. And she's asking specifically if you could share a little bit about what cognitive ther therapy is, who does it, is it something that families are able to take advantage of right now? Oh, so I'm going to back up to um, a, a project that we funded out of Boston Children's, out of um, uh, Chuck Nelson's lab. Um, so cognitive therapy is essentially you know, cognition, um, the ability to think, the ability to do analytics. And uh, we funded uh, Ch Charles Nelson, Chuck Nelson uh, at Boston Children's to essentially uh, work on this aspect of Rett syndrome. And he actually took one of the standard tests for measuring IQ and adapted it for girls with Rett syndrome. And, um, and that's called the Mullins. And he adapted it for girls with Rett syndrome and um, tested a large number of girls and actually found that in many aspects, the girls had same cognitive development as uh, the normal uh, controls in the study. There were places where they were deficient, but places, but in many places, they were as intelligent as the normal controls. And so these are the kind of things that are being developed with the TOBI, uh, the exercises that you have with the TOBI. Um, that's the best I can help right now is those type of exercises that you're doing with your Tobies. Um, I think down the road, uh, people are looking and thinking about new tools. And that's what I was talking about when we're testing new devices. So right now, it's essentially the only tools that are really out there are your Tobies and how you use those Tobies and to help your child learn. Those are cognitive exercises as they learn, the same way that you might have, uh, that you might learn as if you were to get on something um, uh, like the, uh, the, the uh, I'm blanking on the names of the programs and um, that you can get on to, um, to, to, uh, to challenge your own co cognitive abilities. Um, Oh, I'm blanking on those, but the the Toby and the Toby programs and the programs that are written for the Toby are many of those are cognitive exercises. So I hope that answers the question, Paige. It does. So it is definitely an arena that is being explored, and we're pushing the edges of discovery on what that means. But we know it's very important, and you know, as a parent, I can I can respond and recommend that um, you talk about that with all of the therapists and, and special educators who are working with your kids and ask them to do a little bit of research in the area and see how they can blend um, cognitive challenges into the typical therapies that they're doing and how to not keep communication separate from physical therapy. Um, it's the integrative approach and it's the enriched environment, which I think will get you a good head start. Um, as we're still funding research and pushing people to define what that means um, in the field of Rett syndrome. It's a really, it's a new area, but critically important. Would you agree, Steve? Yeah, and I think, again, I, I, I want to call uh, the importance of Chuck Nelson's research. That's research that I believe that parents, and again, we have the reference, we have it um, available. That's a, a reference that parents can actually use when they're sitting with their schools saying, this is possible. This shows that these girls are cognitively very active and can learn. And so let's actually make a curriculum that's going to challenge them. So um, there's scientific evidence now backing the, that up. So when a parent is sitting with their school system developing an IEP, there's science data that says it is it, it's there's possibilities there's there's there there let's use that science to actually help parents in their daily life when they're interacting with their community and trying to get the best education for their for their girl or their boy with Rett syndrome couldn't agree more thank you 
I'm going to jump um, again, taking these questions in sequence. So kind of going, um, jumping from neurohabilitation to a genetics question, if I may. Um, next question in the queue is, is, is there a list somewhere where a parent can find um, a list of missense versus nonsense mutations? And follow on question is, are nonsense mutations known to be less severe in expression than some of the other mutations and or deletions? Um, yeah, th this is this is a good question. Uh, it, the answer is quite deep. Um, lists lists of mutations can be found uh, um, at a database that RettSyndrome.org sponsors. It's called RettBase, and you can find RettBase uh, very easily just by putting that word into a, a search. And you can actually look at you know, the over 900 different mutations that have been described. And you can you can see where the point mutations missense are, the point mutations nonsense mutations are, also the deletions and the insertions. So um, coming back to the question of severity, um, I I'm going to harken back to Joe Zhao's uh, uh, proposal to us and the mosaicism, we can actually, and our natural history study has done this. They have looked at a large number of exact mutations, um, and there are individuals in those mutation sets who span the this, this severity spectrum. There can be, you know, two girls who have the same mutation. One is severely affected. One is um, is nominally affected. And the challenge is why? And a lot of it, we believe, or many people believe, could be because of mosaicism. It could be because th there's more normal cells in one girl and more mutant cells in another girl because of a, dis a, a an abnormal distribution when those cells were developing of mutant cells versus normal cells. So it's very, very hard to say, um, you know, this mutation is going to give rise to a more severe phenotype or that mutation a less severe. The natural history study has shown that some mutations give rise to a more severe phenotype, other mutations to a less severe phenotype. But in each of the mutations, you can still have a spectrum of severe to uh, less, less affected. So I, I don't think you can make a one a one to one uh, in answering this question um, because there's so much biology that we don't know at the cellular level. And um, every girl is probably different in regard to the number of normal cells, the number of mutant cells, and the essentially the arrangement of those cells uh, within the CNS. I hope that it isn't too blah, blah, blah scientific -y page. Well, if the parent who asked the question wouldn't mind commenting and letting me know if you have a follow-on question to that or if um, it helped you understand, I would appreciate it. Um, and while you're uh, typing that in, we'll go to the next question in the queue and we'll circle back, okay? Um, in other words, I can't say that if I completely understood it or not. Every time I hear the, the talk, I understand a little bit more. And so, um, we, the next series of questions in the queue were from a newly diagnosed parent who has joined us today. And I know there are a lot of newer parents who may be hearing a lot of the research information for the first time, or maybe has tried to read it online, but this is your first live opportunity to digest a lot of it. And I just wanna comment that I've been on this journey for a long time. I've had the benefit of sitting in a lot of scientific meetings and I've read a lot of journals and I've done a lot of research and it, as soon as I think that I've got my head around a concept or an idea or a grant or a project, um, the deeper I go, the, the tougher it gets for, um, for me to understand sometimes. I, I go in and out of understanding. And I want to thank Steve for really taking the time to take very complex issues and try to reduce so many of them into a one-hour presentation and reassure those who might be feeling the same way. Oh, I'm getting it. I'm not getting it. Oh, I thought I had a handle on this, but it's actually really confusing. I think that's a normal experience for us parents. Um, and this is not a one and done presentation. We always will give you regular updates in the field of research. We will always be available to you 
to answer questions. Um, and again, the reason we're recording the session today is so that you can go back and, and re-look at this information once you've um, done a little bit more research on a particular area that was, was maybe confusing or you wanted to know more about. So don't consider this a uh, closed conversation at the end of today. Just consider this an update and an opportunity for us to continue down the path together. Okay, so the particular parent asked a lot of questions um, that are very specific and unique to their child. And if you have questions in that area, um, contact me directly and we'll take those offline. Dr. Kaminsky, um, we call you Dr. K, but you really are a scientific researcher. And so I'm gonna ask that we take some of the specific medical questions offline and I can redirect you to some of the other ret eds that we've done with our medical experts. Okay, so I'm gonna to jump to um, the next question that uh, is related to the content you presented today. And we have a question that is, um, is anyone that you know of, Steve, working on ways to diagnose Rett syndrome sooner? And what might that look like? Oh, yes. The, the answer is yes. People are, um, are working on doing actually um, uh, in utero diagnosis. But here's the challenge. The challenge as we know it today is that it's a clinical diagnosis. So a child is given the diagnosis of Rett syndrome once a, a, a number of clinical features have actually presented themselves. And the big concern for everybody in the field is, is there a way that we can actually move backward, if you will, towards birth or before birth so we know a priori that somebody has or doesn't have Rett syndrome. The challenge is that there are individuals who have mutations in MECP2 who don't have Rett syndrome. So if in fact you use a genetic prenatal diagnosis of having a mutation, meaning that's equal to Rett syndrome, that actually could be a false assumption. So people are, are conservative in that regard that that genetic diagnosis of a mutation in MECP2 doesn't necessarily mean somebody will have Rett syndrome. Um, now, I have been asked the following question, and I think it's a great question. Well, so what? If they actually have a mutation, why not treat them anyways? And I think there is a school of thought that surrounds that. The only challenge that we have is could you actually push development the wrong way? And I think that the FDA would not allow us to do that because the FDA essentially is there in a way that essentially says you will do no harm. And, and it's, so I think that there are people who are trying to look at sounds of a newborn baby, motions of a newborn baby, and trying to say, are those indications of Rett syndrome, as opposed to waiting until you see something as hard as the clinical evidence that we're using today out of the 2010 paper by the Natural History Study team. So there are people who are looking at new ways to do it as early as the child is crying, the child is moving in their crib. Um, this is work that's coming out of Germany. Um, and that's, that would be a, 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 a faster way to do it. And there's also people who are looking at, can we do prenatal testing on the gene and use that maybe in conjunction with this other aspect of crying movement in a very, very young uh, neonatal, in the neonatal state. So those are two of the things that people are thinking about. Um, I'm hoping that people will actually come up with some other aspects where I would hope that biomarkers will show up at some point. To date, we don't have them. Um, that would be great if we had biomarkers. Biomarkers would, would be would be a sort of the kind of thing that we would love to have. There's the biomarker. Let's start an intervention. Um, so um, I, that's 
what I know at this point, Paige. I wish I knew more, but that's why uh, in our near term and long term, I, I continue to put down earlier and earlier diagnosis and earlier and earlier intervention. Okay, I agree. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, and we can touch on the work of advocacy and awareness um, in getting physicians to be attentive to parents who I think are often, we're often saying to our child's pediatrician, um, before they see symptoms of diagnosis or of uh, var a variant from typical development, you know, most pediatricians are trained to reassure parents that things are fine. And we as an uh, advocacy group um, in the field of developmental disability, but Brett syndrome specifically, are always talking to our representatives to say, um, train in med school, pediatricians listen to parents, please don't dismiss. And um, we hope that there are measures that can be definitive that will help a pediatrician who is in, you know, 60 kids a day for 10, 15 minutes to be able to quickly um, validate whether a parent really is seeing something that is not a full-blown um, symptomatic child with Rett syndrome yet, right? Because that earlier intervention is, is important. So continued awareness is a key piece along with developing those scientific measures. So as an organization, we're attending to all of all of those areas. Um, okay, the discussion around cognitive therapy, um, Steve, really resonated with quite a few families. So in the interest of time, I want to um, ask if you can come back to this a little bit because we know that therapies are something that we can try to push for now. Kind of two themes of questions here. One is, can you talk a little bit again, is cognitive therapy something that can only be done on a eye gaze device or is it communication? Is it Toby specific? We know Chuck Nelson's study was done with the Toby, but there are many eye gaze devices out there. And there are many communication means, high tech, low tech, no tech, that our girls and women who are on a spectrum of fine motor, gross motor, and communication abilities, some with preserved speech, can take advantage of. So parents are wondering if you can kind of fine tune what you mean a little bit by cognitive therapy. And then the second one is from our group of parents who have women with adults and uh, uh, women with Rett syndrome who aren't as actively engaged with um, therapy for insurance reasons, they've aged out of programs, um, their, their day to day uh, life isn't as, is, as rich with the number of providers working actively with them. And they are asking um, for some suggestions and ideas for ways they can engage in cognitive therapy. Yeah, um, all good questions. Um, so I like Paige, um, this, this, is, this really comes down to the imagination uh, of, of each individual family more than anything else. To I, I gave Toby as an example because Toby was used in the Chuck Nelson study and Toby is being studied around the country. Toby's been studied for reading uh, out of uh, Appalachian State. Toby's been used for other issues uh, out of Montefiore with uh, Susan Rose and uh, Sasha Duchek. So Toby is one of the aspects. But again, um, girls that may have some functional use of their hands um, could, could actually be using iPads, touch pads. Um, a, a, a study that Pam Diener has done, um, which is very interesting, um, she's used uh, essentially virtual reality, game playing with girls with Rett syndrome um, to try to help them use their hands, gain skills with their hands, purposeful hand movements, but at the same time, using programs that challenge them, their, their cognitive abilities, their thinking, um, and the girls have to make choices with their hands. So again, that's two kinds of therapies there. It's a physical therapy 
or an occupational therapy for gain of function of hand use, but it's also a cognitive therapy in that they have to make a decision, a yes decision, a no decision, a right, a wrong, a left, a right. So there's, there's all sorts of, of tools that are being developed. Now, let's say you don't have any of those, but you have the ability to, to, to communicate with your daughter, um, adult daughter, uh, or uh, children, males or females, and you come up with the games that you might use to actually help teach them. Um, we do this with our other children all the time. It, we don't have to follow a, a, a curriculum, um, or we can follow a curriculum, but oftentimes we don't. We, we would figure out ways to teach uh, a daughter or a son something without a curriculum. The girls with Rett syndrome are exactly the same. How creative are we as parents to get them to think, communicate, and whether your daughter communicates with a squeak, with a hand movement, with an eye movement, with a head movement, you are, in, the parents are incredibly, incredibly um, uh smart and intelligent in watching and learning how to communicate with their daughters. I've watched this across the country when I go visit. Now use that same skill to actually teach something. And so whether it's um, a question, you know, uh, a hypothetical question, a yes and no question, it's that's cognitive therapy. It's the ability to essentially answer, answer, question, question. And I know it's hard from the standpoint that they can't question you, but you can question them and you know how to actually interpret their signals. So um, I think that as Jenny Downs has demonstrated, an enriched environment changes the quality of life. And so in those environments, that you find yourself with your child and you know the way they answer to you, you know when you ask if they're hungry, they answer, you can do other things. It's not just asking if they're hungry, it's other questions that actually makes them think. And, and you have learned patience, more patience than anybody else that I've ever known in, in regard to the apraxia and understanding it will take my daughter a couple of attempts or some time to answer this question, but they will in fact answer the question. You just have to be keen and patient for them to answer the question. So um, the other thing that I think is very important is cognitive therapy is exactly what your daughters do when they go to school. That's cognitive therapy. They're in a learning environment. So make sure they're in that learning environment and what can you take home from that learning environment that you can put in your environment? Or what can you take to that environment so that the teachers in that environment understand exactly what you're expecting of them as they go about the, 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 the gaining of skills through learning? Um, so it's everything and anything, Paige. It's not just Toby. I use Toby as an example, but it's everything and anything that you, any tool that you would have that you would teach a normal child, you can use that same tool to teach a child with Rett syndrome or an adult with Rett syndrome. You just have to be patient and you just have to be, um, you know, you might have to adapt it a little bit. So you might have to be flexible. I, I, so there's no solid answer here, Paige. Somebody's looking for, you know, the fix. If I do that, it will happen. I think it's, it's going to be, every individual is going to be a little bit different and you're going to have to figure out what works best with this girl, with that boy, with this adult woman, and so on and so forth. Each one is going to be probably a little different because like all of us, we all learn a little differently. We sure do. Great, great answer. Thank you. Thank you for going um, into such deep detail on this. Uh, it's obviously very very intriguing opportunity and challenging one for all of us um, and one that I work with families all the time around. So please, if anyone wants to discuss this further, reach out to me and I'm happy to help you go through the decision tree of what is the right communication channel for your child and 
the uh, communication guidelines project that has um, been funded and is looking at ways that our diagnosed children around the world are communicating um, across cultures, across technology, across services, across funding sources um, will be coming soon. So I just want to give a good plug that there are tools that are coming to help you and uh, the information you've shared today, Steve, I hope will inspire people to just get going, be creative, do what you can, and we'll continue to invest in developing guidelines to help you um, and to help so, your children. Paige, could you also um, mention, um, I, again, I was with Paige at, at the, in LA uh, at a, at a, a day in in um, in Los Los Angeles, and Paige was fortunate to bring a very very um, successful, bright and effervescent um, woman from uh, from uh, the Oak from the Oakland area down to talk about some of the things she does, and she has some wonderful videos, and I would encourage everybody to watch what this lady does with girls with Rett syndrome. And yes, some of it's with Toby's, but I think she also uses other tools out there as well that are not just Toby related. And some of the things that she she's able to demonstrate with the girls is absolutely phenomenal. Paige, could you mention those some of those videos or where they might get those videos? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, um, and thank you for recalling that presenter. There are many experts in the field of communication working so um, so incredibly creatively uh, with our girls and women with Rett syndrome. This particular speaker is Judy LaRiviere. She is the occupational therapist and AEC specialist at Katie's Clinic for Rett syndrome at UCSF in Oakland in the Bay Area. And if you choose to come to that clinic, you can have your child or adult assessed with Judy. Um, she has been a guest presenter at a previous Ret Ed, I believe it was July, it was this last summer in 2018, and her session was recorded and is available on the Ret Ed website. I just sent a link um, to the previous Ret Eds uh, in the control panel there, uh, where you can access a presentation given by Jenny Downs about the enriched environment and her study. And you can access her Ret Ed from Judy the Riviere that shows some of those videos and talks about a lot of strategies. Um, and that particular presentation that she did for Ret Ed uh, was really about making communication count and gets into both devices and uh, low-tech, non-tech um, strategies. Mm -hmm. So take a look at all the past RET Eds. Um, and I think this is a nice segue into one of the last uh, few questions that we'll be able to get to um, today. We've got about 10 minutes to wrap up. So let's take two or three more questions. And this will be your, your chance, everyone. If you have additional questions, get them in the queue. If we don't get in uh, to address them today, we'll take them offline and develop a QA document. So please type in what you're, what's on your mind. Um, but to, to let's take us from therapies to the natural history study. We do have a parent who asked about the natural history study and um, how to how to enroll in the natural history study and what um, participating in that research um, can afford a family, as well as being able to to help with the understanding and data collection. Sure, so actually Paige is much better equipped to answer this question than me because she has been doing it and part of it for uh, well over a decade, but I will take a quick pass at it. The natural history studies at 14 sites around the country, uh, hopefully we can expand it. Um, it essentially uh, studies all aspects of Rett syndrome from from hand movements to dietary habits to growth. Um, and by participating in it, you actually get to interface with some of the best uh, clinicians in the country and many of the clinicians who will be conducting clinical trials. But more importantly, you're putting data into a large data set that allows people to analyze the data across all women, children, boys and girls with Rett syndrome, as well as some other syndromes uh, like FOXG1, 
CDKL5, MECP2 duplication. And um, the, 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 the thing that it does is it allows the data set to be, remember, with rare disorders, uh, it's hard to know exactly what's going on. But by doing the natural history study across 14 sites around this country, you're able to accumulate enough data that you can see trends and those trends lead to best practices and best practices lead to a better quality of life. Um, and at the same time, it opens up training for the clinic and for the families on what to expect when one enters a clinical trial. Paige, why don't you also add to it because you have a firsthand experience with it. Thank you, Steve. I have. Um, we have been enrolled in the natural history study for over, a, uh, well, I'm not going to count the years out loud, but we've been involved for a long time. Um, in the previous um, cycle where it was a travel site, as well as now that we have been able to, um, as the PI team, to get the um, natural history study appointments in clinics. So if you've been around for a while and you haven't participated in the natural history study, you may be recalling the days where you could travel to one of a few cities like Chicago, New Jersey, Oakland, um, down in Florida for a weekend with 50 to 100 other families and have, it was a gathering and it was research data collection and it was a really wonderful experience. And you may have thought that those stopped when the travel clinics stopped. But in fact, as Steve mentioned, they are now integrated into many clinics across the US in order to allow you to see a clinician, do your data collection, but also have, if you can arrange it, to stay for a regular appointment at that clinic and benefit from whether it's a multidisciplinary team or some time just focused on your child with one specific RET expert who is the investigator and data collector. Um, it's a different experience than being together on a weekend with a lot of families, but by being seen at a clinic, um, you can contribute to research. The experience will help you prepare for enrolling in clinical trials because it's going to force you to go through the exercise of getting your genetics test, your medical records, um, your language, your understanding of your child's symptomology down and help you prepare for the next stages of clinical trials. And it will hopefully also afford you an opportunity to stay after the research portion of the visit and have a regular visit and assessment for your child. So that's what I would say from a personal experience um, to add on to the reasoning for the natural history study. And if anyone has questions about where's the nearest location to where I live, you can go to retsyndrome.org and search natural history study, and you'll see all of the sites that are currently enrolling families. Um, this isn't to talk about the natural history study, but I think there's a, a new important dimension for families who haven't been able to participate in the natural history study because of health issues of your child, your family dynamics, um, distance. They are, um, they have gotten permission from the NIH to do some remote data collection. If your family really has um, a, a situation where you can't travel, this is relevant for some of our boys with Rett syndrome who can be very medically fragile. It could be a situation for our women with Rett syndrome where living situations might be a little bit more complicated. So if you'll take a look at the natural history study on our website and reach out to me, I can help you connect at any level that would be doable for your family. Every single person in our community and on the phone today can participate in the natural history study and we hope you'll consider it. Anything else to add to that, Steve? No, well done. Okay, great. All right. Why don't we take, we've got one more question. Let's take one more question live and then um, we can take others offline. Again, we'll get them developed into a QA. Sign this, I'm trying to scroll to it again. Hold on one second. And this goes to the mosaicism um, information that you presented. Here we go. Okay, so we have a question. Do you, and this is a, 
a big pivot off of natural history study. Um, do you see any need to determine the level of mosaicism prior to any therapy, particularly gene therapy, that will need careful control of MECP2 levels? Very technical question. Yeah, the answer is no. I, re, re, I think, again, the, mosaic, the, the mosaicism study is really to better understand what's actually happening from cell to cell in Rett syndrome. Um, it's not going to change the way our current therapies, whether cell therapy or gene therapy or small molecule therapies work. Um, um, but it's, we still have to, I still think that people want, uh, uh, and I put this slide up for a reason, the basic understanding of what's really going on at a, at a molecular level and cellular level is, is, is still needs a lot of research. Um, you know, even though we've been studying it for two and a half decades, we still don't know everything. And, and as Paige says, just when you think you understand everything, something new comes along. And so the mosaicism is going to essentially teach us things about cell to cell interactions and how do we actually make the environment better as we continue to develop new therapies and better therapies. Um, and I, I want to end with this. The therapies that are in test right now, the therapies that are going to be tested, whether it's trophinotide, serozotan, Anavex, um, uh, Avexis's gene therapy, those, those are today. And, that, and if any of them have a positive effect, that's going to be great. But that doesn't mean that that's the therapy for five years from now or 10 years from now, because we're going to improve upon those things. Because the, in order to essentially benefit the girls and the boys and the adults the, to the largest extent, we're going to have to continue to refine the therapies. Gene therapy it will need better vectors because it, the way it's uh, being introduced through inter, interthecal injection is not the best way. You, so new vectors will have to be developed to, for an easier delivery. Um, maybe the gene is not quite the right gene. We might, 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 might want to change it a little bit this way or that way. Um, or maybe RNA editing becomes the, the therapy of choice because you don't have to use the, uh, a, a whole new set of regulators. You can use this, the natural regulators of the genes. So the therapies will continue to be developed. And as you develop those therapies, you still want a better basic understanding of what mosaicism does and how that does it from cell to cell, how these cell to cell interactions take place and how those cell to cell interactions actually cause the tissue to organize or not organize the way it should organize in normal development. So um, it won't change the current therapy strategies today, but it could change the, st the strategies tomorrow. I hope that helps, Paige. I hope so too, because that brings us to the end of our time together today. So if the person who asked the question, if you want to send me a quick comment, um, go ahead and get it in the queue now while we still have the application live. Or anyone, you can feel free to contact me anytime with your questions. I'm going to um, put my email address into the chat field. And I can answer questions myself. And if it gets beyond my ability to answer, I can connect you with Steve Kaminsky because uh, your presentation today, I hope, triggered more questions than we have answers for. And I know many of our funded investigators are um, pursuing these questions diligently, and as they make discoveries, new questions are coming up for them all the time. So this is a process, but I, we really wanted to spend time together today to let you get a sense of how complex the field is, but how much we are really trying to attack it with a plan. And ah, there we go. I'm going to switch the screen over to one of my favorite sayings and one of my, um, a phrase that I try to wake up and live every day is don't call it a dream, call it a plan. And Steve, you've really given us a sense that there is a plan to this complex life and unexpected life that many of us as families are find ourselves on and we really appreciate yourself 
the others who joined us on the um, call today. Um, we've had a lot of researchers, clinicians, and people from industry listening in today, and we hope that they have benefited from your perspective as well. I know they have. So thank you for your time and your, um, your passion, your compassion, your hard work, and um, your action to help us make our dream into a plan towards real treatments and a cure for Rett syndrome. No, it's my pleasure. Being with us. Okay, and we wish you uh, best of luck, Janice. Okay, to our attendees, I wanna close by saying that um, we hope families especially that you found value in today's session and that the knowledge that you learned here today will empower you in all kinds of ways. Um, in your path forward. It is complex. We are making exceptional progress. And um, especially to parents, I want to request that you try your best to understand that progress and that as we progress and the year goes on and we ask for your involvement, whether it's to complete a questionnaire or a survey or enroll in the natural history study or contribute to a biobank, or to consider enrolling in a clinical trial, that you consider it sincerely. Um, if it seems difficult or out of reach for you to decide, contact us and we'll help you talk through the decision tree. Um, it's an incredible time uh, that we're at where true research participation is not only a reality, it's as critical as fundraising to continue the progress that we are making and we appreciate each and every one of you that has engaged in research or helped fundraise for the research that, that Steve is marshalling through. So thank you for being with us today. We believe that it's an information on Rett syndrome um, should be free to all who avail themselves of it. So I have to thank all of our donors and supporters for sharing in that belief and supporting these webinars so that we can invest more donor dollars into our research programs and we'll be back with you again to give you more updates as the year goes on um, but we just want to leave you with the, the the comfort and the confidence that your children are worth our every effort and your every effort and we welcome you to join us next month Tuesday March 12th um, at the same time same bat channel for our next Red Ed topic, which will be a good night's sleep for all. We'll have a world-renowned retologist, Dr. Daniel Glaze with us from um, the Bluebird Ret Center, um, who will spend a good amount of time talking about sleep issues. And if that's something that you're dealing with in your family, we look forward to seeing you next month. And please um, look for a link to the recording of today's session, share it out with people who couldn't be with us today, and share the Red Ed calendar with everybody in your community. I know that there'll be a topic that will be of interest to you. And if you don't see a topic that is of interest to you, drop me an email and we'll get one scheduled. All right, that concludes today's webinar and we'll talk to you next month. Thank you again, everyone.